Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to part hey. two of this week's right. stream. Offline right. and in charge is what All we're right. calling it. So now. when we left off, we were talking about the Tax Collector. Yeah, which is the new film from David Ayer, correct? Uh, Portland's favorite director and uh, John's favorite as well, uh, and also one of mine. Um, so the Tax Collector is a lot like his. It's it's basically like all of his other movies. And what I was saying before we left, um, I understand what they are. Machismo, mm -hmm. culturally inappropriate, racially stereoty racial stereotypes everywhere. They're all about gangsters and bad cops. And this one is this one's less about the bad cops. This isn't Street Kings or Harsh Times or anything like that, or even mm -hmm. End of Watch. Um, it's it's about gangsters and it has star Shia LaBeouf and uh, Bobby Soto. And I actually really like Bobby Soto in this. And, Basically, they play two two uh, two thugs for a for a, a, a LA uh, crime boss who go around collecting taxes from the from the other from the other gangs. That's their job, right? Right. And of course, something goes wrong, and they find themselves targeted, and their families and their friends all targeted by somebody more vicious. Uh, that is the entire plot. It is not much of a plot. It is a David Ayer plot. <laughs> it's a David. It is a David Ayer movie, um, and there have been a lot of things written about David Ayer this week, as there always are whenever he has a movie like this that comes out. And people were attacking him for being for glorifying corrupt cops and things like that at a time when uh, you know police brutality is a thing that is mm -hmm. like that people are talking about his movies. I guess they feel are are. Um, inappropriate at this point in time but the think piece that I posted about which is on the playlist and I can't remember who wrote it but it really doesn't matter um, basically says basically says all of his movies are like that they all glorify um, police violence and corruption and things like that and I've seen literally every single David Ayer movie I mean everything right from when he was from when he wrote Fast and the Furious to U571, which is his first credit, his first screen credit, submarine movie. Um, I've seen everything, literally everything. Suicide Squad, Bright, Fury, all of it. I mean, we can run down it real quick. U571, The oh, Fast training, and the Furious, Training, training Day, Day, SWAT, Harsh Times, End of Watch, Swat. Sabotage Fury, Suicide Squad, Tax Collector, and he's got Bright 2 coming up, along with The Wild Bunch. So, I mean, there's a theme to the kind of stuff he writes and does. Yes, very, very much so. He makes... Mm -hmm masculine movies for dudes right right that's, that's the kind of movies that he makes and yeah a lot of his movies do deal with corrupt cops and corruption but mm -hmm. none of those guys are ever the hero in any of those movies right <laughs> none of those guys in none of those movies in fact and, and half of them the cops die or they or or or, or end up in jail i mean it, it, his movies did not glorify uh in fact they they're usually commentaries on police corruption Right. No, so I think if you want to be, if you come in, and this is why I don't really allow very many think pieces on our site. I don't like them. Um, I don't like them because people, they usually, and most of the time, is people starting off with an opinion and then building their case afterwards. Right. Which is not the way you're supposed to do it. Um, and the person who wrote this piece about David Ayer clearly had, uh, let's take down David Ayer agenda. Because David Ayer is an easy target. Mm -hmm. David Ayer's an easy target. His movies make him an easy target, right? His movies make him an easy target, um, and he's had a couple of a couple of high profile duds like Suicide Squad, which I actually like, but a couple of high profile duds like Suicide Squad and Bright, um, which make him easy easy to go after. That's what this piece was basically doing, and I, I felt like I had to defend him in some sense. Mm -hmm. And as for the tax collector, I went in knowing exactly what the hell it was going to be. And I, when in my review, I noted the one thing that really turned me off to it was Shia LaBeouf, because he plays he plays a uh, he plays a character who, and I understand the, what they were going for here. I just don't agree with it. I don't like it. I don't like that type of character. But mm -hmm. he plays a, a white character who has basically appropriated the his perceived mannerisms of the people he hangs around. Right. So he talks. He talks like a vato, you know. He talks. He talks with the with the Latino accent, and he acts like he's like he's Latino, but he's not. Mm -hmm. 
You know, he acts like it. That's the way he's perceived them. Is it appropriation or appreciation? Because if you grow up in that community and that's what you assimilate in, technically it is appreciation rather than appropriation. I don't know. I don't know which one it is. Straight and up, honestly, they don't. They don't go. They don't go. They're 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 not being a nuanced enough for me to be. Yeah, this is not that movie. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> this not. This is the movie for that. That's but, something uh, I've never gotten, and I, I've never understood, and I just assumed it was because of of where I've come from and all that, but. Like, I understand uh, if you're making fun of somebody's culture, you're making fun of the way uh, a, a group of people do something. But, like, the appropriation thing, like, isn't somebody else embracing somebody else's culture a good thing? I just never really understood that, unless they were taking it and, like, saying it was their own. Well, but, it also depends on, like, what we do with that culture anyway. Like, Right on. Okay. With, like, you know, with here, here. With black culture, white people take that stuff and they mm. use it as their own and profit off of it and make it, you know, their own thing. But, you know, there's so many other institutions and stuff with, that is hurting black people. But also, right. but also, white people will will appropriate something from black culture and be praised for it where black people won't be. Exactly. One uh, of one of my prime examples of this is black girls in high school who are told to take out their braids their dreads, whatever like that. But when a white girl does it, they're considered exotic. You know, they're, you know, it's okay, stuff so like that. that I can get, but I see, I yes, see it used that, all the time to, but to that's like, the reason why, that's the reason why people frown on shit like this, because that's kind of, that's the kind of inequality that happens in regards, right. in regards to it. Oh, because I see it being applied to something like somebody wearing, you know, uh, a white person or a Latin person wearing a kimono because they think it looks beautiful and then being called out for appropriation. So that's where my confusion came from. So what you're saying makes sense. I can see how that would be an issue. Yeah. Um, but it's, so it's not just, it's not somebody appreciating the culture. I guess that's why you said appreciate it against, uh, instead of appropriate. Okay. I'm clear. So, so this so has been your it, dumb white guy question minute. <laughs> there's always one segment like this for sure. Yeah. Well, you know. we should have that. <laughs> So, all right, so what did you think about the tax collector, though? Because I'm not going to lie. I actually really dug it. Um, it's, it was it's a David Ayer movie. Violent, super violent, really gory at times, too, actually. But I thought there was really really great intensity from Bobby Soto, who I had never seen before as an actor. I think he's fairly new. Okay, um, so when you – because when you first said his name, you said, oh, Bobby Soto, who I really like. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, did I miss him in something? Because I've never old, seen no, him I don't before. know. I've never, never seen him before, uh, mm. before now. Um, yeah, I think he's really good as a guy who's trying to, who's, who's coping with the fact that he's got these, this dual life. Like the main thing and thrust of the movie is that he's got a family to watch and take care for, but he also lives this very violent life on the other side. And that's that's a dynamic we've seen a lot of times before, but I think they did a really good job of of, of showing it and showing how it impacted him yeah. as he realizes that those two lives cannot possibly exist at the same time. Yeah, there's, like, there's an like overlap. There, there, there comes a point where they, he has to realize that it's not possible. Right. And how that affects him, I thought the movie did really well. Well, and that's if, if people want to hate on David Ayer, what, what they can hate on him about is just being not completely original every time. I mean, and that's that's not even really something to hate on him about because his his movies all have a strain. And if you like his movies, I think you'll like Tax Collector. That, that's, like that telling, that's like telling Scorsese he should stop making that monster movie. Right. I mean, he, he's. I mean, it's 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 just nonsense that people say stuff like that. Scorsese right. makes monster movies all the time, and telling if you do vari- it well, variations of the same story, and we all love it. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, and and if the one thing that Ayers has maintained See, throughout Portland, his career, what do you want to say? No, I, I, I think it brings up a point though of, you know, I'm. Unless I, I don't know any better, Ayers is white, right? Does he have the right yeah. to like tell the story about, you know, a Mexican drug cartel? I mean, that's a you know, that's an argument that people people could have. Does so he have like, the right to tell a story of a Mexican well, drug cartel? Well to tell the movie's not necessarily about the Mexican drug cartel, it's about Right, but no one's gonna tell, you know, the Italian Scorsese, you know, stop making that mafia movie or that's not accurate or that, you know, whatever yeah i don't know my point of like you know as we get into conversation about who has the right to tell a story or you know i can't remember air's background and i don't know is it he's a white guy from bethesda but um i mean 100 percent. he's he's from bethesda maryland he's 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 basically me but more talented um so there you go um (laughs) 
but no, I mean, David Ayer's all of his movies, they, they have the same, uh, they go down the straight line of this tension that he is just really good at building, whether it's end of watch or training day, you know, as the day's going on and you know, end of watch, I think is his best movie still. Uh, I, think, I think end of watch is still his best movie. Training day is up I there, but I, I think train, honestly, training is up there, but he only wrote that. He didn't direct it. Oh, so we're, yeah, I'm talking about all, everything he yeah. writes. He writes, yeah. and that's the, that's the genius of it is he writes things that have, and it's not just his writing, it's his writing I, that creates such I, tension in the story. I feel like Training Day is better simply because of Denzel, but the movie itself, if it were cast by anybody else, we would say that was just another uh, David Ayer movie. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's, that's, it's, it's Denzel that elevates it. Training End of Day Watch is has like be, great on its own. Yeah, Training like, Day has it's, to be great. Denzel's top one of Tay's top three movies, at least the most, the top three iconic. I mean, at the end of his days, people are going to still be saying King Kong ain't got nothing on me. Uh, you know, yeah. and it's up there with his role as Malcolm X. It's, it's up, up there with all this stuff. So, I mean, that's, it's hard to beat that, but end well, of it's, watch. It's the, it's the one he got the Oscar for. <laughs> is, is it really? Why am I not remembering that? I don't know. Oh, wow. How about that? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really good. I mean, everything else aside, if you can sit there and watch it, I didn't. I didn't get the feeling, you know. Yeah, Labouf is uh, is is a white guy, and he's he's playing this this um, you know character or what have you. But beyond that, I, I didn't get the feeling creeper. that it yeah creeper. Well, I mean this this character as in this person that's you know appropriating, yeah. appreciating, whatever. Um, but I didn't get the feeling watching the movie that it was being very um, uh, uh, exploit exploitative or anything like that. It's just. Uh, he take, took his took a story, whether it's accurate or not. Um, it's it's fun to watch, uh, and the tension that builds up, the 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 place that you feel these people in, when you can actually feel the characters on screen's lives falling apart or getting to that crossroads where they're gonna, their lives not going to be the same. That's a good movie to me, and that's I mean, Tax good Collector job. had that. That's a good job. It's getting shit on pretty hard though right now, but you know it, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, what else? Do we have any other movies to talk about before we get to news? I know you've been talking a lot about the burnt orange heresy, and I'm wondering if that how much that has to do with Elizabeth yeah. Debicki. But what I, it we has, didn't see that. But what, what did it you has think? a lot to do with Elizabeth Debicki. That's what, what I figured. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I figured. I whenever I question why you like something, I'm always like, all right, which girl is in? It's girl? not. That's not always the case. Like, there's there's no girl to like in the tax collector. So, you know what's beautiful yeah. about this, though, Cortland, you being here, is before you started coming on, everybody, all the viewers were, were led to believe that I was the misogynistic one. Uh, and now we're seeing the other side. You, wait, wait, you still are. You still are. Not, not you still are. the last two weeks. You still are. <laughs> the tables you still have turned. Just... <laughs> yeah. No, Elizabeth Debicki is, is fantastic in the Burnt Orange Heresy, which the interesting thing about that movie, and I can't remember the guy who directed it. It's I think it's an Italian filmmaker whose name I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, it it released. Uh, I believe it was Sony Pictures Classic released it back in March, and I watched. I tried to watch it back then because I was going to review it, and I couldn't make it twenty minutes into it before I turned it off. I was like, I'm bored. Oh wow. Um, yeah, and, and then I watched it a week ago, like, you know, to, to review it again, and I couldn't get enough of it. It was really weird. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it's pandemic related or something, <laughs> but. <laughs> What's that, Cora? The quarantine changed you. It's, it's right. possible. It is entirely possible. Something has changed between, from then to now. I mean, is there but, some... So it's it, here's this not hired to steal a rare painting from one of the most enigmatic painters of all time. An ambitious art dealer becomes consumed by his own greed and insecurity as the operation spins out of control. It doesn't really sound like topical enough to be influenced by this, but that's that's a, a question that I always have when I see movies, especially when I disagree with the, the consensus. I'm like, was I just in a different place? Was I just in a different mood when I was watching this? Because it yeah. can really greatly affect it. But well, this, what was it you loved about it so much? It's a movie that I feel is what Velvet Buzzsaw should have been. And I, I, I remember seeing Velvet Buzzsaw at Sundance and being super disappointed by it. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people like it and it's dark humor and it's take on art world critics and stuff like that, but I like it. Be- I like what they do with it in Burnt Orange Heresy better. Uh, Clay Spang is an art critic and he's just, it's about, it's basically about two opposing conflicts and Elizabeth Debicki plays the opposite end of this conflict. And he's a guy who um, sort of believes that art is is best for what it conceals about the truth 
about the world. Mm -hmm. And she's like, she thinks art reveals what is true about the world. And it's, it's, it's interesting that they have these conflicts because they have this, like this, this intense passion for one another. The very first scene, the really first, the very first scene of the movie is very funny. He's, he is standing up in front of a bunch of, you know, clueless Americans giving a lecture about a piece of art. And, you know, he puts it up there and he tells them about it. He's like, anybody want to want to print of this? And nobody, nobody wants it. And then he tells them this elaborate story about the artist uh, and how they painted this piece while they were uh, in a concentration camp and that his art is what saved him from being killed. At the camp. He would make paintings for the, for the, for the soldiers. And after he tells the story, he's like, so does anybody want, anybody want a, a print of this? All of a sudden everybody wants it. Right. And then he goes and he tells him, oh, by the way, this story is all bullshit. <laughs> did the hands go all down? Through. I did this in five minutes right before I came on, basically. Oh, and, wow. you know, and he tells him, but he's like, but he's like, but you see, the value you have on this painting was completely created by me. I'm the critic. You should fear my power. I mean, he's not wrong. That, that, right. That's so, a really interesting take because... It is, it is interesting. And he has this, this, this philosophy throughout the movie, and it's... It, it plays out in interesting ways as he gets wrapped up in this this scheme. It's almost like a like a high scheme, but not quite. Where mm. he's hired by uh, by a, an art connoisseur played by Mick Jagger, who was really good in this, by the way. Really, uh, really cool in this. Everybody's cool in this movie. This is a super cool movie. Like everybody is very slick, very mm. posh. Um, which is I think probably the reason why I was bored by it in the beginning, but whatever. Um, but now I like it. Whatever. Uh, but anyway, he's hired by 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 Jagger's character to to uh, to acquire a painting from a from a recluse who's like the most legendary artist in the world right at the moment. He's hired to to acquire a painting from him. He doesn't paint anything anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it devolves into what is essentially a, a murder plot. You know, it takes a turn that you don't expect. And the movie is is, is kind of like, you know. It, the, the ending, the way it, the way it twists into a murder, a murder story, to, uh, is is not what you expect. But then again, one of the key points of the movie is that you know you should never accept a painting just to, uh, look, accept a, accept a painting for what it is based simply on the brushstrokes. You should always look further, look deeper, mm-hmm. and that's what the movie is trying to tell you. And it's, I think the the plot plays out in that way as well. But um, but yeah, Elizabeth Debicki, her character opposite Kleist Bang, who Kleist Bang was in The Square, which is another movie about art world and art critics. So he's like, it's like art, art movies everywhere all of a sudden. Right. Um, she is just fantastic as his his polar opposite. She needles him all the time about things. And she she makes really smart and witty comments about art. And that just, that pisses character off and sends him in different careening in different areas. It's just a great movie. And yes, she is super fine in this movie, too. So I'm not going to lie. I'm just amazed that she hasn't really <laughs> broke huge yet. She's got everything about her that seems like she would break huge. I mean, even right after I Gatsby. Loved Elizabeth Debicki, first time I saw her was in The Great Gatsby, mm-hmm. the one with Leonardo DiCaprio, where she played my favorite character from that movie, which is Jordan Baker. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan Baker is my favorite character from The Great Gatsby. Um, so I, I love anybody who plays that character. But I had never seen her before, and I was like, "Who is this? Who is she?" And she's been great in everything she's ever done. Mm-hmm. Um, remember her in Guardians of the Galaxy two, um, right. although that was not that was like my least favorite role of hers, honestly. But she's she's just fantastic. Um, she's I think this is her way best. in the tale on um, that HBO uh, yes TV movie with uh, Laura Dern. Um, yep, that, that was such a powerful performance. Yep, mm-hmm. totally. Uh, but look, the burner orange here, see, it's not going to be for everybody. It's very, it's very wordy, very talky. You have to pay attention to every single thing that people say. You can't half ass to watch it. So um, it's probably not going to be for everybody, but I dig it. I'm in now just because the art world is something that has always mystified me, or fascinated me, I should say. And not so much because of the talent. You're probably right the first time, mystified. Well, mate, yeah, no, yeah, probably because it just... It mystifies the, me sometimes. The, I the mean, fact that my... you have art that is like a... a blotch of red and a splash of blue and it's worth 16 million dollars i mean you know it's it's weird when that that uh conspiracy theory about the art world all being just a high stakes money laundering uh scheme by the world's rich actually makes sense i mean because it really has to do with that like i could 
go out and do a Banksy type painting tomorrow, it wouldn't be worth six bucks. But Banksy does the same thing; it's worth six billion bucks. So yeah. it's just it's crazy. No, I mean, so I it's like true. That. It's true that the stories behind paintings are what makes them right. For sure, yeah. And that's, that's really what it is. Um, which is like, which is why that opening scene in the Burnt Orange Heresy means so much because it's true. No, oh, yeah, it's true. The the a painting's worth is is totally dependent on the value we place on it. So, you know, I mean, so, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mystified by the art world too. I, mean, I, you know, my, my ex-wife was a, was an artist, a painter. Mm-hmm. And so I used to, I got wrapped up in it and I like it. I love going to galleries and looking at, looking at, and, oh, yeah. uh, all the time. I, I love it. But, um, I appreciate you know. art. I just don't understand the culture behind it. I guess is, is yeah. My, my I appreciate thing. the fact that they can do stuff that I never never could. For I sure, can't, I can't draw with crayons. So um, it's what it is. So we've got we also got waiting for barbarians. I don't know if we want to talk about that at all because there is a lot of news this week too. We're coming no, we in on wanna, about we want to skip waiting for the barbarians, even though uh, it has been the most the most read review of the week on the site because people wow. yeah well people. I mean, you, you put Robert Pattinson. Robert Pattinson is enough already, by the way. Just mm. putting him in a movie. People want to read it. Uh, Robert Pattinson, Mark Rylance, and Johnny Depp of all people all in the same movie. People are interested. Uh, and I actually quite like it. It's directed by the guy who did Embrace of the Serpent a few years ago and uh, uh, Ciro Guerra. And he does movies about colonial colonialism, basically. Mm. And this is a different take on it. All three of his movies that he's done have been about colonialism. Um, this is about the brutal side of it. So, <laughs> so uh, if you're interested in that topic, this is a movie you want to check out. But yeah, we're not going to go into it too much. Cool. So, because we we do have tons of news, I don't know if we want to get into DC yeah, fandom yeah. first or, or cover the rest of the little stuff first. But there's all kinds of things happening. Um, you know, DC fandom had a, a tons of news come out this week. But let's let's go through the other stuff first, real quick. I mean, I, it yeah, sounds like both of you are stuff, most. But- most excited to talk about. Sorry, most of you are both of you are most excited to talk about um, Captain Marvel two news. Um, it's got a director yeah. apparently. What do you guys think of that? Nia DaCosta is going to be directing Captain Marvel two. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nia DaCosta she uh, broke out with Little Woods, which is a fantastic film. Tessa Thompson and Lily James, uh, great movie. She's doing the Candyman uh, uh, sequel, like a sequel, whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, from Jordan Peele. So, yeah, I think this is a great move. She's the first black filmmaker to do a Marvel movie. It's good stuff. What do you think, Cortland? Yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see what she does with it. Um, when I saw that Candyman was going to have that shadow puppet part of it, that kind of thing, I was blown away by that. So whatever she brings to Captain Marvel is is great. And, um, yeah, I'm really, I'm really, really excited to watch her do her thing. I feel like because they're bringing her in, mm-hmm. I feel like they're going to make Monica Rambeau a bigger deal. Yeah, Monica Rambeau. Yeah, Monica Rambeau. One of the women who's had the moniker of Captain Marvel uh, was in the first movie as a child. Mm-hmm. Um, as a child, um, she grows up, and we know that she's in another Marvel movie or another series. She might think she might be in Doctor Strange too. I can't remember which, which thing she's showing up in. Uh, we don't know how she'll show up, though. We don't know if she'll show up as Photon or Spectrum or or shit. Maybe she'll show up as Captain Marvel. We don't know. I mean, who knows? But I think that hiring DaCosta tells me they're going to put some emphasis on on uh, Monica Rambeau. You agree, Cortland? Oh, ab- absolutely, yeah. And especially um, her mom is played by... Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget her name, but she's going to be in the new Bond that was supposed to come out in April. Yes. Push back. So yes. especially if that, you know, whatever, amid COVID and all that, whatever that does for her career, what uh, whatever Bond does for her career, I feel like that is definitely going to be amplified and they're going to profit off that in Captain Marvel 2. So, of course, it makes sense that, you know, Mia DeCosta. You're talking about Lashana Lynch, Lynch, right? Every time yep. we've had a black woman. Lashana Lynch. Say that last part again, Coral. It's about freaking time we 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 have a black woman in the director's seat of a Marvel film. Like it's it's yeah. time. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it's it's it, they're long overdue for it. Um, it's long overdue to have a black woman direct super, superhero movie. Period. Yeah. Um, 
other than well, I can't remember who directed um What about the Eternals? Wasn't I could have sworn I thought Eternals was the Eternals is, is uh, Chloe is Chloe Zhao. Chloe Zhao. Oh. Chloe Zhao. So. It's, yeah. and, and um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on her first name, but uh, is it Cindy Yan? Oh yeah, yeah. Kathy Kathy. Yan. Kathy, sorry, Kathy Yan did. Uh, Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which is Marvel, I know that. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. It's fine. I don't know what. I'm, why I'm thinking... about superhero movies in general. Yeah. There haven't been very many black women to do very many of them. Was it, uh, am I missing any. some news? It wasn't Ava du- DuVernay um, directing Eternals. Ava yeah. DuVernay is doing. Um, what, what am I missing here? I got something mixed no, up. No, Ava DuVernay is doing uh, the joint for DC Comics. Um, oh, that's right. New Gods. She's doing New, new Gods. Gods. Yep. Okay. She's doing New Gods over there. Well, who knows when that's going to drop? But mm-hmm. honestly, we might hear about it at DC Fandom. I mean, DC Fandom is is taking place on August twenty second, and it's shaping up to be everything that Comic Con wasn't. Comic Con at home was a big disappointment. Yeah, uh, we're not going to lie. Um, to, in terms of like, apparently they got a prep, like no people watching it, which is sad. But um, but in terms of like big news dropping, there wasn't a lot of it. DC fandom has everybody showing up. Robert Pattinson, Zack Snyder, Matt Reeves, the entire cast of Suicide Squad. There's supposed to be a sneak peek of that. They were going to get a sneak peek of everything. It seems like they're doing the Warner Brothers Hall H presentation that they do at Comic-Con every year, except they're doing it virtually. Which, well, that's, that's what was missing from Comic-Con. awesome. Because Comic-Con just felt like, it felt very, very, um, you know, guerrilla marketing type. It just... It felt like, hey, this isn't actually being put together by anybody, but we're all just going get, to get on the Zoom calls, and then we'll slap a logo on it at the end. This seems like – the only thing I'm pissed this off about – This is a very coordinated effort by them. Right. Uh, and it's, it's, it's like shaping up to be really big. The only thing I'm pissed off about is that if you go to DCComics.com uh, and look at their official fandom site, they have this awesome-looking map of the global experience – and it just looks like the coolest freaking theme park you've ever seen. Um, you got the watch verse, the fun verse, insider verse, kids verse, you verse, all this stuff, and the hall of heroes in the middle. Um, well, I don't really know why you care because you would only, you would only be able to go to kids verse. Well, <laughs> it's enough just to go there. I think I'd be happy for what I, I have. Think you'd be, I think you'd be very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Does does DC own Mighty Mouse? I don't know if they do. I'm in. Um, <laughs> Teen Titans still on Cartoon Network when that count as kids? Yeah, there so. you go. There I you go. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Titans. Unless you, mean like, unless you mean like the, oh no, that's Titans. That's the one that's on. Titans the show? No, no, I'm talking about like Teen the Titans. Kid, the show, animated, like the yeah. little animated, yes. Yeah. Did we ever talk about Titans the show on here? I don't know if no, I've ever talked I've never about it. Wa- I've never watched you it. You haven't? So. It's so good, man. It's so good. <clears> um, <throat> Word for it. <laughs> yeah. I guess you'll have to, but it, it was, it was all, all of the DC Universe shows in my opinion, have been good. Uh, Doom Patrol has been awesome. Uh, I've heard a lot about Doom Patrol. Maybe one day I'll watch it. Yeah. Even Swamp Thing wasn't bad. I'm still kind of surprised it got... I think that was just poor timing, but... Yeah. So, I mean, do we know exactly what the fandom experience... You said it's going to be like the Hall H, but is it going to be similar to Comic-Con where they're just doing Zoom calls and then running a clip yeah, in the middle? It's, 20, it's going to be 24 hours of virtual virtual stuff. Um, I don't know if we'll really know until, until it actually starts happening. So... Um, but I actually might need some help to cover that one. That seems like it's going to be a lot. We'll see. It's going to be a lot in a small period of time, so we're going to want to probably um, divide and conquer on that. What's that, Corlin? I was just asking when it was, the 21st. Uh, August 22nd. Uh, so it's just one day, 22nd. So uh, what else we got? Uh, James Wan is doing a Knight Rider movie. That's amazing. Um, I knew you'd be excited about that. I am, but I'm not, because here's the thing. Knight Rider was such an 80s concept but it also fits perfectly right now with, you know, you could see Elon Musk coming out with a Tesla that's like Knight Rider. You could see it happening. But so much of, I mean, Kit is such an iconic character. I'm going to call it a character because he is. Um, that when you change him, it's not the same. Like, you know, we, when the Knight Rider Are TV they came him? out, it, Are I, they I seriously doubt they're going to run with the 85 Trans Am. If they do, no. I'm happy for it. But, they, they, you know, more, more often or more likely than not, they will change the car. Um, and so I, mean, I think David Hasselhoff is the more iconic one out of that duo. But you think so? You think yes. Hasselhoff? Yes. Um, yes. I mean, Kit Absolutely. didn't have a beach show. That's for one. But I mean, I, I think you know, 
You show, you show, well, and he's big in Germany too. So, okay, well, Hasselhoff's made bigger, but not in my world. My world, the car, it wins. And I think, you know, James Wan was able to do with Aquaman uh, something pretty amazing. Uh, he was always already kind of established, so he didn't get full credit for that. But, um, you know, he took the, the lamest character and made him one of the coolest characters. I'm, 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 I'm cautious about this just because this is not the first, second, or third time you've heard about a Knight Rider or anything. Right. So I'm just like, well, I'll wait and see when it happens, because it yeah. is it is tough to 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 make that work. It is. It's you know, not in, easy in live action form. The part of the reason why it worked in the '80s because we were accepting a lot of goofy shit in the '80s. Yeah, it's competition it, was Airwolf work now. <laughs> Airwolf was the competition, and that just had a good theme song. Last week, uh-huh. Travis, you uh, talked about Scream, and you know whether or not that needed a reboot and like what mm-hmm. they could do with it. I kind of feel the same way about, you know, Knight Rider. Do we really, really need this right now? Yeah. Like probably. what else is there to say? And no, I think it's junk point, food John, sure. of like, you know, doing kind of like the Elon Musk point that you just made. I mean, that makes sense. Right. But mm. I, again, like I don't necessarily. Yeah. I mean, I would watch something that was like, you know, Knight Rider meets, you know, 2001 a space odyssey you know not being able to get out of the car because the ai is being an asshole like i totally watch that i feel like if you're gonna do if you're gonna reach back for stuff like this you need to do it ironically or do it sort of like you got a 21 jump street do it sort of yeah sort of like that or do it like like how cobra kai uses karate kid or something like that you need to do something different with it rather than just trying to use the same concept like the concept's not enough you gotta do something new with it I honestly, even though Fast and the Furious is still huge, I still think the idea of a guy and an alpha male with a cool car is so dated as being something that people look for. I mean, it's just, it's not what what everybody's into these days. So I think if you're going to do it, you have to do 21 Jump Street. You can't even go the other way and, and, and make it something actual. I think it's almost got to be MacGruber at that it's point. It's got to be the right filmmaker to do something like that. It would have to be mm-hmm. like like a Michael Bay type to do that sort of movie and do it with the type of, with his brand of seriousness. I would you know, love he, that movie. He, he <laughs> takes that, he'll, he'll take that stuff seriously even if we don't. Yeah. And then, you know, so it, it's kind of like, like a movie like Pain and Gain would be right now. Like Pain and Gain is a right. movie that is that takes itself super seriously even though it's dumb. It's mm-hmm. dumb, dumb, dumb. Um, you know, and, and or, or more, 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 more accurately is, um, is maybe Six Underground. Six Underground yeah. is, is stupid as hell, but Michael Bay takes that shit seriously. You know, he'll, he'll take the concept seriously, even though it's ridiculous. And it's better um, for it. It's, it's I, mean, I, I guess. I also don't see it as any, <laughs> like, theatrical release. Like, if you're going to yeah. have a Knight Rider reboot, like, that's what Netflix is for, right? Like, like Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I don't see it as a theatrical release at all. Yeah. I yeah. Agree. yeah. I mean, How much time we got left, John? Uh, we we oh. are at the end. Um, okay. So I was going to let us go for another minute or two. Um, we are not beholden to our stream stuff, but just to be careful, I'm keeping it in an hour. Well, we, um, don't take, we don't want it to take four or five days to get the edit in. Yes. Hey, that was one time. One time. I found, I found out what happened, by the way, right before I started here um, today. Uh, so I'll clue you in on that a little bit later. I think the only thing we had left to touch on in the news, let me check my news and notes, Oh, uh, your Dirty Dancing sequel, obviously, in Star Trek being on hold. I don't know if you want to touch on those at all. The Star Trek thing is interesting to me, uh, only because they can't seem to get that franchise going um, movie-wise. Yeah, they've had three movies, but they've, none of them have been, like, gigantic hits uh, under J.J. Abrams. They've been No? Okay. The first one wasn't a gigantic hit? No. It was a hit, but not a gigantic hit. Hmm. And, and second and third ones have done worse. And then they were going to do the fourth one that was going to have S.J. Clarkson directed, who's been the first female Star Trek director. That mm-hmm. fell through, partially because of Hemsworth and all those guys when the Hemsworth was supposed to come back. And Pine and all those guys were uh, having contract issues. That fell through. And then you have the Tarantino thing, which they've been talking about, the R-rated movie that he was going to do. Apparently, based on this news, that movie could still happen. Um, he dropped out of it, though. Tarantino's out of it. Um, he's not going to do it anymore. But the movie could still happen. It still has a script from Mark Smith, uh, the guy who did Revenant, Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, and they're saying it's, it's, it, it involves 1930s gangsters. It's mostly Earthbound. 
and it's based on it's based on the season two episode, which at least they don't say this, but I know enough about Star Trek that I know this episode they're talking about. It's called A Piece of the Action, mm-hmm. uh, which is a star, season two Star Trek episode where they land on a planet where everybody's basically living living the lives of 1920s gangsters. Uh, okay. so it's, it's 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 kind of it's kind of one of those episodes of Star Trek that that it's more humorous than anything else. Um, so it's it's obviously based on that to some degree. Um, and I, I'd be very interested in seeing that movie, that version of Star Trek on a big screen. The problem is I don't think any way, shape, or form Paramount would let that happen. Um, it just seems weird. Um, yeah. But the thing, but the, the big news out of it though is that Noah Hawley's film is he was hired to do a movie, which would have been a total reboot. Um, he's the guy who did Fargo and um, The Unfortunate Lucy in the Sky. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he did those movies. He was hired to do that. That movie's on hold now, which I think I think we've all been able to see coming for a while because there hasn't been any movement on it since he was hired. So it's on hold. Who knows what will happen with it? We don't know where they're going with Star Trek right now. It's kind of in the same place that Star Wars is in, which is that the movies have kind of fallen off and now they've found better success in streaming star yeah. trek is better in streaming right now finding more success now in streaming than it has on the big screen so why fuck with it <laughs> well yeah and i mean that may not i don't give matter. a shit about star trek by the way I, I think star trek sucks for the most part but i'm uh, just wondering what the benefit <laughs> of an r-rated star trek would be because to me like that was always one of the draws of the future in it and like the the signs that everything was pre- uh, perfected is that you didn't have foul mouth sailors and crazy stuff going on, but it also like a really lousy future. Yeah, it does. It does. It's like Demolition Man, but even further ahead. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think streaming is where that happens. And and they could make these movies if uh, what was it the the man the the gray man gray man two hundred million dollar movie coming out. Um, if that does really well and they see it succeed, then the big budget big name properties will start you know taking a, a dip in the streaming pool and that's exactly where that can happen Cortland any thoughts on Star Trek do you care about Star Trek what do you like Star Trek um I like the I like the original like 1966 or 1960 okay. version um I've seen a few of those and I, I I like those um I saw the first Star Trek the day it came out and then 24 hours later I saw it again I liked that a lot um, I saw it twice in two days so yeah I, 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 I like that um, it, you know it's it's hit or miss and I think um, I, I'm not like huge huge into it I'm not like a Trekkie yeah. or anything yeah me um, yeah I think I think Travis your point of keeping it on streaming like if it's not broke don't fix it and I think yeah. streaming is sort of why is it bad that it's on streaming and working there? Like, why do we have to, you know? Right. Yeah, I never felt like Star Trek was... Star Trek has never been gigantic on the big screen, even when they were using the original casts. Yeah. Um, right. You know, they were... It, Star Trek is one of those things that is... It is very niche. Like, you're a Star Trek fan, and there aren't a lot of casuals who go in to see a Star Trek movie. Mm-hmm. It's just not the way it is. I mean, I don't know. I don't know any casual Star Trek fans like who are like dying to see a Star Trek movie. Like, there's none of them. Yeah, right? they, well, don't, I think they don't exist. The new movies, so. the Abrams movies, brought a few more of those people out. Because I, I that was the that was the point of them. The point yeah. of them was to make them more. But then again, but see, the the, the drawback was that all of my classic Star Trek fans hate mm-hmm. those J.J. Abrams movies. Yeah, because they're not like everybody. they're not like Star Trek. They're not about the code or anything like that. They're not about right. the science, the discovery of it. They're about action. Yeah. So they, the, <laughs> so you're, you're sacrificing one to get the other. And I don't know if you they ever really got enough either. Yeah. So, so if Star Trek dies, it dies. Of course. <laughs> Just kidding. I and on know. that note, what do we have next week? Anything <laughs> major coming out um, next week that we look forward um, to? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Still have a couple weeks until DC fandom, Um, so that'll be two weeks from now. Uh, We'll be able to talk about that. Um, I don't know. We'll we'll saddle Cortland with some stuff to review for next week. I don't know. I'm not gonna. Um. Oh, you know what I have for next week? I have Spree, which is that movie with Joe Keery that was at Sundance where he plays the 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 the, uh, kind of an Uber driver who goes on a murderous rampage. 
Um, I actually just watched it uh, very early this morning. Mm. Um, and Project Power, which is the super superhero ish movie with Jamie Foxx and Joseph Gordon. Oh yeah. And then I'll probably try to watch tonight. So well, that's what uh, I've got. So we got some things coming out next week then. And, uh, until then, uh, this has been cinema Royale. Check us out every day at punch Uh, make sure you go into, uh, Twitch and follow Travis cinematic underscore enforcer. Uh, on Twitter we're I'm punch drunk. John Travis is punchy critic and Cortland. I got to put yours on here as well. What's, what's your Twitter handle? Um, at Port Portlandia. At hey, she remembered it this go. week. Yeah. Nice to remember it. So check us out there. Also, twitter.com slash PDC movies to follow our official uh, Twitter stream. And uh, we appreciate you watching. Until next week, we're out of here. Bye, everybody. Bye. Later.